Welcome to the show, Boba. How are you? I'm fine. I'm feeling super excited to be here today. <laughs> and thank you very awesome. much for the invitation. Well, first things first, uh, we start the champagne frivolities. So I think we both have a bottle here. Um, you chose Rosé Sparkling, which is a great choice. Um, it is like quite a hot day in winter where I am right now, which is like 27 degrees. <laughs> so you, you're in a very hot summer as well. So I think Rosé is the perfect way to, to cool down. So let, let's open this and see what happens. What do you think? Yeah, let's see what happens. That's the, <laughs> that's the scariest part. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, um, I've got, this is the second time I've had this on the show, but I've got a, a French uh, Canard du Chien. It's a, it's a Rosé Champagne in a half bottle, 375. I think you've got one as well. I have a Brut. I haven't tried this uh, Champagne or this drink before, but Sparkling. I think we have occasion. <laughs> so. It was something that I found on the average store. It's not something super, super special. It was just like, okay, it's it's there. And we both we both agreed that let's have a small bottle of uh, champagne. And I was like, okay, so I need to just choose. And that was it. Okay, I'm gonna pop my own. Um... On one, two, three. Oh. Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay, I think my mine even doesn't have a, like a cork. It's... That's okay. Yeah. Okay, um... let's, let's pour and... Okay, so that's that's mine. It's a it's a pretty deep color. Okay, let's cheers the camera. Thanks for coming on the show. Oh, it's nice. It was a nice shot. Mm, yeah, that's good. What's yours like? Um, it's a very long time since I have drink uh, uh, champagne at eleven a.m. in the morning on Friday. <laughs> Yeah, sorry about that. The time difference is terrible. I either either I have to sip champagne at like eight o'clock, eight o'clock in the morning or seven o'clock, or or my guest has to. So I'm like, thanks for taking one for the team. I appreciate it. <laughs> no, it's all fine. Uh, I I already I prepared this uh, Friday a little bit, kind of less of the work that I will do the podcast with you. We will drink champagne, <laughs> and then the rest of the day I will be a little yes. bit. Like... Uh, for people who maybe haven't listened to some of the other episodes. Um, there's two ways to make rosé. Uh, one is that you take white wine and you put some red wine into it, like a tiny bit to sort of make it a bit in between the colors. The other way is that you bleed the grapes. It's called sanye in, in French, which means to blood <laughs> or to bleed. And what that means is that you'll take all your grapes and you'll crush them into a big vat. So all the white wine will be in there. And then often rosés are made with Pinot Noir, which is a red grape. So they'll put some of the skins um, in the barrel and let it sort of ferment. And, and the, the color from the skins and the flavors and bitterness bleeds into the white wine as it settles down the tank. And that is a lot harder process to control because you can go a bit too much and it tastes pretty bitter and weird. Um, but they tend to be the more interesting rosés with a bit more flavor and complexity. Um, but for, for most of them, they'll just do the assemblage method or the blending method, we call it. Um, so yeah, most like 90% of rosés will be this. If you see, and they'll have this kind of more orangey color, like you can kind of see, um, or like a, a light sort of blush. But if you see something that's quite crimson red, um, mm -hmm. that is generally the, the bleeding sort of method, which is a bit more expensive and a bit more niche. Mm -hmm. So anyway, there you go. There's some facts about rosé. Champagne or sparkling. I sort of found out about you on LinkedIn, like most guests, <laughs> which is pretty funny. And there was a bit of controversy at the time and it sort of came on my radar that way. But um, I know that you are friends with some other famous strategists around the world. Um, I follow Mark Pollard in, in America quite a bit and some other people. And you sort of like came up on my radar that way. And then I looked at some of your resources and I was like, oh, this is really interesting. And then I found out that you were doing very something very similar to Vicky Ross, like creating a community for the benefit of other people in that that role around the world. And it wasn't like a monetization thing. It was just like you were helping everybody out. So I found that really cool. Um, so anyway, here you are on the show, but maybe just like a, a quick minute. Um, if I was meeting you for the first time professionally, how would you describe who you are and what you do? Officially, I am a creative and brand strategist. And uh, um, this is not a role that I have kind of described myself in a way that how I feel myself, but it's just how the industry understands what I'm doing. 
at least here in Europe, like if I'm positioning the brands or if I'm like uh, helping uh, to name the brands or think about the brand futures, then you are a brand strategist. And if you are working with, uh, with the creatives and thinking about the advertising campaigns, helping them to come up with the better ideas and come up with the advertising uh, strategy, then you are a creative strategist. And that's how it's defined, uh, how this role is defined here in Europe. But what I'm doing on my free time is that I am helping uh, the community because I believe that if I will lift up others, then others will at some point lift up me. Like, you know, that it's like a mutual kind of give and take. Yeah, and I'm trying to help a lot of also uh, junior strategists by, by, by giving classes, uh, and uh, by doing uh, one-to-one strategy coaching where we are privately talking about their issues and we are setting up their uh, kind of a development plan and then we are kind of working through it and I'm trying and I am helping them to succeed and get to the next get to the next level so that's what I'm doing on a daily basis and that's I guess how people okay. see me also on the LinkedIn you said brand and creative strategist as opposed to other types of strategists that may be in the same niche um you mentioned you're not a media strategist so these are two separate roles can you just sort of run me through what the difference is between that in an advertising agency for example or even client side i did some research i collected like these role definitions through the time uh, starting from 1967 when stephen king came up with account planner uh, definition like you know the new role in the, in the industry from where all this kind of strategy or planner role kind of grow out and, uh, and nowadays we have so many different kind of strategy roles, like, you know, there are social media strategies, as you said, media strategies, then they are like cultural strategists. They are, I don't know, probably experienced strategists and, you know, you name it. And uh, if you are asking me why I'm not or, or, or why I don't define myself as a media strategist, is just because I do believe that there's like, and I know that there's a profession on the media agency side where people are actually thinking about the media channels, about the budgeting and in which channel the ad would fit the best and in which media channel the, the, the campaign should need to be delivered to kind of um, be received by the audience the best. So that's why I don't define myself as a media strategist, because I think that role, as far as I have talked with media strategists, it's very kind of different and distinctive from what I'm doing, because they are focusing more on uh, data and data analysis, and uh, and the role is totally different from what I'm doing. You did mention about the, the history of account planning or, or, or strategy. Um, can you just tell me, like, where did that start? Like, it was a, a London thing in what the 60s or something i think you mentioned in account planning like for people who maybe have retained an agency but don't really know all the roles can you sort of just like position like where would a strategist be and what their role is within an agency so we sort of understand that if we hire an agency and we we have a meeting and there's a strategist there we kind of know uh, what they did, what they do, and where where that role came from, or the necessity behind the role. The origin of this role uh, it started in 1967 when Stephen King from uh, GVWT uh, came up with this role for his agency, and there was a kind of cultural need or kind of like a cultural context, the situation in the industry when. Um, it used to be that um, marketer, marketing teams were st- sitting in agencies in, during that time and then started the shift that uh, clients understood that they need to take these people, hire them, these marketing people for their side. And basically, they kind of uh, borrowed them uh, from the agency field into the client side. And now it's totally obvious that we have uh, marketing teams on the client side and we don't even uh, question uh, or think about that there could be like a marketing team on the agency side. And the other aspect was that uh, there was a need also in the market to better understand the customers because there was like a client side and then there were like a creatives who were delivering a creative ideas and they were missing this a little bit, the, the bit of information like how real people are perceiving that and how real people are thinking about the products. So that's why um, th- there was a need in the market. But the history is very tricky. And I read the book by John Griffiths. It's called 98% uh, Pure Potato, which is based on interviews with uh, 
with the with the with the strategists or account planners who were working in uh, GVWT and BMP agencies, which were two agencies who originally kind of came up with account planning as a role. But these two agencies did this discipline or started this role in a very distinctive way. In uh, GVWT, it was more about like a grand planning. They were following the planning cycle that Stephen King kind of created. There were like five steps, how they were thinking about the strategy, which started with the situation analysis, like where we are, why we are here. Then it moved into the visioneering part, like where do we want to be with the brand? The third part was about how we gonna get there like basically what's what will be the strategy and the last point was about uh, measuring aspect like are we getting there like you know are we really achieving our goal and what they were doing like constantly they were thinking about like how advertising basically works like uh, how it really impacts and influence people on the other side there was the other agency bmp by stanley pollitt uh, who who created the, that role in his agency he has an essay a very famous essay by himself where he admits that uh, he took the name for for his agency for the title from the Steph- St- stephen king and uh, that he basically borrowed the title but what the guys or account planners did on the bmp agency was that they were uh, focusing a lot of research, they were doing a lot of one-to-one and focus one-to-one interviews and focus groups. They were going into the real apartments, to the real target audience, to real customers, and they did uh, a, a, an interviews. And they were also doing a, some sort of ethnography, and uh, that's how they came up with some. That, that's how they came up with some interesting uh, findings about how re- real people are living and how real people are perceiving ads and how they are also uh, consuming the products. And as you can see, um, those are kind of like a two different um, ways how to approach the strategy. And uh, Stephen King, who was on the other side, that's why he called like his team or his department that they are grand strategists, that they are thinking about the brand building and like a big vision. And that the guys on the BMP were more like ad tweakers who were just like trying to improve some, some small bits of the advertising. So that's the history. You know, I, I mean, I used to work in agencies and with, with strategists as well. And um, the role that I sort of saw them as doing, like in a practical sense, just dumbing it down, is that, you know, creatives on their own will just go off and do some crazy ideas. And that may or may not affect the commercial outcomes or the goals and objectives that the client wants to achieve. And the other side, if the client is too one dimensional, they can sort of not see their real customer or not appreciate the power of creativity. So for me, the strategist was like the bridge between the two people who, you know, in an agency, sometimes you'd have a a literal line in the office between where the creatives sit and then the account planners sit. So the strategist for me was kind of the ones that would bridge the gap between the two and, and, and fill in the gaps uh, in, in a way and sort of moderate some of the excess from both sides. And then, yeah, like you said, tap into research and things like that. And and, and draw it all together. But I also found that my, maybe more recently, I would say some of the strategies are just used as like for sales enablement. So they're just there to help win a pitch and provide some sort of legitimacy to what the agency wants to do and to make it look better and maybe do some quasi research instead of like real research. So I, I have met some strategists who are just like glorified salespeople in a way. Does it make sense? Mm-hmm. Um, but there are some other ones who are like, doing it properly. I I get you uh, about what you are saying. Like originally the role of the strategist in how it was kind of defined, like overall in both of those agencies, GVWT and also BMP, that strategist role is to advocate a consumer. Creative's role is to advocate the idea and account manager's role is to advocate the client. So our role as the strategist would be to know the best what the consumers want, what they need, how they how they see the ads, how they perceive the world, why they like this brand versus the other brand. And that was our role. And nowadays, this role has shifted a lot, I would say, into the creativity or into the creative uh, creative strategy. And we are now more focusing on the creative solution strategy. And this is just my opinion based on the conversations with strategists, based on my own uh, research surveys, and based on my experience by working with strategists that we have shifted into this creativity kind of aspect. And we are kind of even 
stepping on the feet of the creatives. And this has happened due to a lot of things. It's not that strategies are craving to kind of be half creatives and half strategies, but it has happened due to the fact that we have shorter deadlines and creatives are overwhelmed with a lot of other things where they need to put their inspiration in and, and think about these ideas and solutions and to kind of not waste the time, strategists are a little bit forced to also think about already the creative territories or sometimes we call the ways in. And some strategists love this approach. They feel like a fish in the sea. They feel that, oh, wow, this is my place. I can think about the strategy and I can think about the creative ideas. And some strategists are struggling with it. Like, for example, myself, I feel like I want to do my part where I'm like very confident about the research part, where I'm confident about the uh, uh, consumer that I know who are these people who are buying these products or who are buying our competitor products and why they are doing that. And then comes the creatives who are based on my strategic direction coming up with the ideas. But these models are mixed and different agencies in different parts of the world are, again, working differently. And, and that's, I suppose, what your research found out, wasn't it? That mm -hmm. there's a lot of variation between the role of the strategists and what their responsibility was and mm -hmm. how it was expressed in different regions. So I, and I find it the same in, in, in sort of the area that I do, which is, is more business strategy or, or sort of marketing, strategic marketing layer. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, some people are just, just in promotions and other people will go into product and other people will do both and other people go into distribution. Some people go into operations and some people won't. So it's like just putting strategy in front of your, your title doesn't really mean anything in a way, but I still feel that, you know, strategy in itself is like it's all goal orientated and you choose a direction and you provide sort of like actionable solutions to to that problem or, you know, that opportunity to, to make the most out of it. So it's like, it's the same sort of like meta principle, but just expressed and there's so much variation of funds. I'm just really curious because you do some freelancing on the client side as well. So what is that like compared to working inside an agency? It's a way how you can get closer to the client because when you are working directly with the uh, CMO or you're working directly sometimes with a small or middle side um, company, then you have a direct kind of connection with the owner of the company or CEO of the company. And then what you are proposing uh, for the company, like what would be the direction in which way they need to go, it's something that you as an expert are proposing to them and you don't have like a middleman, which is like an agency and management team or creative team who are having different point of views. You are more in the position to kind of really help and guide your client. When you are working with the agency as a freelancer, there is this, I would call it like a middleman, and then agency has their own politics with the client, what we want, what we can do, what we can't do, what is agency's philosophy about how the brand should need to build and um, all the other things. That's really good because I'm the same, like sometimes an agency will call me in or, or a consultancy will call me in and sort of like add to their team. And it's a very different dynamic than when you're representing the client because, you know, the principal agent problem, there's conflicting sort of interests there. So it's a very different, I think, flavor of strategy or maybe just different incentives that are at play. But yeah, same sort of principles is kind of what you're saying. You use the same frameworks or approaches for both yeah i mean like of course you can you you can use the same approaches but i mean as i said like in when you're working with the creative agency usually there are other people who are also putting their hands on your slides or trying to kind of, you know, guide you in the right direction by saying, hey, you know, our CCO won't accept your, I don't know, that uh, your strategy slides because they are too long or our client will not appreciate your strategy because it's too uh, too sharp or, or, or really to the point. You need to kind of, you know, add some slides and, you know, make a story a little bit more uh, longer and, and things like that. And um, that kind of always, uh, it, it's, as I said it's like uh, it's something that it's uh it's just happening when you are working with the agency or you are working inside awesome. of the agency so, so you did mention before about research right so like i know um sometimes your strategy is only as good as the inputs that are coming in so the research that you've done sometimes you'll just find this like golden nugget of information you're like oh that's that's the thing that i'll use to take the company in this direction and that's the sort of the golden insight is it true that good strategy is only as good as the research and the insights that are coming in and does that mean on the flip side that bad strategy generally is is poorly researched 
there are a lot of campaigns if we are not talking about the brand building but if we are talking about the campaigns there are a lot of a lot of good and great campaigns that doesn't have a strategy behind them even yesterday i had a conversation with with a very very uh, smart uh, strategist from sweden and uh, we talked about klarna's famous com- campaign uh, which is called smooth and uh, Klarna is in uh, buy now, pay later segment. Uh, if, if someone doesn't know the brand, uh, Smooth is the amazing campaign uh, where they show the uh, the consumer experience through through just showing the feeling, how it feels like, you know, to use their uh, services. And I ask about the strategy and the strategist who worked in the agency where they created the campaign, he said, like, there wasn't a strategy. They just used the approach from Sachi and Sachi, which was called the brutal simplicity. And the creative team basically came with this idea. There's no strategy. It's just a simple idea behind it. And going back to the point, like, if if you have only, like, a good um, good research behind your strategy, then you will have a good strategy Yes, I would say that if we, if you need to have a strategy, then of course you need to do something interesting uh, with your research. You need to find an interesting angle how to look at that. I don't know problem that you that you are facing uh, that your client is facing and you need to solve. Uh, but talking about the insights and that's something else. That's another topic. When I was researching, uh, when I did my research interviews with strategists uh, across the globe during the COVID time. I also asked like a very naive question about the insights, like, you know, how do you define or do we need uh, insight for every campaign? And uh, a couple of very experienced strategists told me like, you don't need to have an insight to build a campaign. And then they told me like, you know, check uh, Cadbury's Gorilla campaign. There's no insight. It's an amazing campaign. It's random, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. And it doesn't have an insight. And they were like, you know, oh, you well. can, come up. yeah, they said like, you can come up with one, you know, if you want, but actually they didn't have any insight. And the same goes for Klarna. It's also a smooth, it's amazing campaign and there's no even a strategy behind it. When I talked with the strategist in the United States and I said, and we talked about the insights, they were like, oh, you need to find an insight. There's always need to be a really good insight on which you can only build a good campaign or excellent campaign. And I said, that's not true because so many strategists who are like, you know, in the business for 20, 25 years, they have told me with examples that uh, there are so many amazing campaigns that doesn't have an insight. And their mind kind of broke down because they were like, how? Really? It's not possible. And I was like, it is possible. You know, Apple's uh, the crazy ones or the think different campaign from 1997. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No strategy behind that. No research, no insights. (laughs) It was just an idea from the person at Chiat Day. It was a creative director, uh, Craig (laughs) Tomenino or something. And he just had this idea that, hey, Look, um, they were trying to win their client back, Steve Jobs, right? Because Steve mm-hmm. left in 85, just after that iconic, uh, 86, sorry, just after that iconic 1984 Ridley Scott commercial, right? So he left and then Chia Day lost the account. BDO, I think, had it at the time. Steve was coming back. They put up the account for tender, uh, like, you know, they normally do. And there's like 20 different agencies on the list. And then Steve comes back and goes, oh, uh, I don't know. Anyway, Chia Day go, hey, we've got this idea for for this thing. And Craig's just like, I had this gut feeling that, look, um, Apple needs to like zig instead of zag and well, zag instead of zig or whatever you're gonna call it. Um, and he just goes, look, I think you guys are for rebels. You guys are the creative people, the crazy people that, you know, do interesting things. And he just pitched us a idea. Just, it was a gut feeling. And, um, and apparently Steve Jobs said, oh, that's stupid. Like, I won't do that. That's dumb. And then eventually they talked him around to it and they filmed it and that was it. And um, yeah, no research, no planning, just, and it's like one of the most iconic films of all time. So like, yeah, I, no, I agree with you. And some sometimes the crazy creative stuff just work randomly, but it, it probably has a high failure rate as well. Yeah, yeah. It's true, but uh, that's why it's very important to remember that there are these campaigns that doesn't have the insights. Just to remind also to a younger generation who are now coming in and they are following these uh, strategy influencers on the LinkedIn who are talking very actively like, hey, you need an insight and this is the five ways how to get to the insight or these are the best insights or there are some structures, uh, sentence structures that you can use to kind of uh, uh, to write your insight and all that stuff. And they're making a lot of money 
on these people who just doesn't understand that you can build a campaign without the insight. Well, there's another thing that everyone says like is the critical factor between a campaign that's really effective or not. So not just the insight, maybe the strategist, but the briefing process. So everyone says, look, a good brief will, will solve a thousand problems. Uh, a lot of people complaining that, hey, clients don't know how to brief agencies anymore because they just don't know how to communicate the same language. Um, a lot of agencies getting frustrated with this because they just get these very weird buzzwordy sort of uh, uh, goals and objectives from their client. And they're like, what do I do with this? Um, so then it makes the sort of the reverse briefing process really hard. Um, what do you say about this whole briefing process? What's your, what's your opinion on it? Briefing, uh, like they are like almost like, I don't know, three steps, four steps, I would say. One is the client brief, then client briefing to the agency. Then there's a creative brief, which is an internal brief for inside of the agency. And then there's a briefing process internally for the creatives inside of the agency. The guys uh, who did this Better Brief project, they, they did an amazing job by researching this topic in a quite interesting way. And the findings were very, very uh, interesting and kind of uh, mind blowing. But what we can see is that nothing has changed more or less. <laughs> you know, it was a huge debate. Everybody talked, everybody so active and passionate. Everybody shared their experience in the comment section. Yes, I have been in that situation and clients were like, yeah, how we can do these things better. And then uh, did they started to change these things? Is there some kind of improvement? At least I haven't seen in my experience. And um, that's why I think the agencies should need to kind of not be scared to kind of talk with their clients and kind of show them the importance of a good client brief and also to maybe sit down and write the brief together. I know there's an agency in UK, in London, uh, it's called the Oliver Agency, and they are writing the briefs together, the first very brief together with the client. And it's not anymore about like, you know, clients sending like, I don't know, 12 to 20 pages with uh, some information in a PDF and then someone on the agency side is sitting and thinking, Thinking for hours like what did they mean by this sentence or how do I need to articulate like this kind of information uh, but it's more like an open conversation where at the very beginning someone from the agency side usually a strategist and someone from the client side probably some marketer uh, marketing manager or, or, or someone from the marketing team are sitting down and just writing the original brief the very first and then the strategist already can go into the agency and start to work with the creatives and I think that takes away a lot of stress and anxieties and also a lot of um, negative feelings between both sides, between the agency uh, employees and also between the, 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 the people who are working on the client side. I, I think that's good. But also, what are the hallmarks of a good brief? Like maybe you can do it together, maybe not together. It doesn't matter. But like at the end of the day, a good brief is better than a bad brief. You'd probably agree with that. Like what what? How do you get a good brief and what is a good brief versus a bad brief so, so everyone understands? The good brief and the bad brief, I think that's the whole lecture that I can uh, <laughs> put together and talk for an hour. To say very shortly, I think the most important part is not in the brief or it's not about the paper. It doesn't matter if it's a brief, like one pager, two pager. It doesn't matter if the strategist has put together a springboard because here in Germany and also in Europe, uh, as far as I know from my research, is that uh, strategists are using springboard, which is basically brief, put in a couple of slides. There's a lot of case studies, also some kind of uh, ads from uh, the competition, what comp competitors are doing at the same time, some inspirational materials that maybe can, you know, spark some uh, ideas in the creative person's mind. So there are a lot of ways how to brief the creative team and how to define what is like a good way how to brief them with the document. At the end of the day, we are human beings. And I think the best way how to brief anyone, and it doesn't matter if it's an advertising world, uh, advertising environment, uh, or, or it's about, I don't know, going out and, you know, give a task to a stranger on the street. It's about the communication. And if we go back like 10, 15 years ago, and this is a kind of lost art of the strategy or lost art of the advertising industry, strategists took the creatives to the, uh, to, to the place where the, where the, consumers were actually using or buying the product. For example, if it was a nightclub, then they were spending a night in the club and just trying to understand, you know, how the, how the vibe, what, what's the vibe or how the people are, you know, um, 
you know, exploring the night. If it was like, I don't know, a, a, a drink, for example, a whiskey, a Johnny Walker, they were going to the bar and they were observing how people are actually using the product or they were going to the shop or store and they were checking how people are actually, you know, buying, I don't know, the FMCG products. And that part is kind of totally lost from, from nowadays. And I think that's something that's, that could really help creatives to, you know, get some fresh ideas. But just because we don't have a time and we have all these short deadlines that we need to, you know, uh, we need to uh, deliver our projects and, and get, get to those deadlines, we don't have a time to go to these real stores and kind of, you know, be in this real um uh, to, to face this real uh, experience. I, I've, I've seen that happen a lot, is that um, there's a lot of data-driven teams now that love data, mm -hmm. but they're very biased in the data sources and types that they used for decision-making. So instead of using different collection methods and like observational research, ethnography, secondary research even, and then there's primary and it's like you've got different collection method surveys, mm -hmm. email polls, whatever. Um, and then you've got also reams of data from your own customers. I think using a, a whole a broad swath of different data sources gives you a better picture. And I find some teams are just very much focused and unknowingly biased in their own data decision-making process. Yeah, like I'm a big proponent of observational research. And um, I just had this conversation with Andres Glusman, who uh, he was the first, third employee, I think, or fourth at Meetup, the, the first sort of growth guy. And the lean startup method was basically based off what he did at Meetup in the very early days in the late 90s. And the biggest, well, one of the biggest data collection methods he used was an in-house uh, live user product usage sort of observational uh, thing. So they would get customers in, into a room, they put webcams up and stream it to all the product managers, and then get that person to actually use the product and observe what happened instead of just, you know, looking at some digital analytics, you know, session based recording um and that way they could sort of ask the person back and forth in real time oh why did you do that or you know what what is happening there and you can't do that via unless you're doing observational real-time research i find so i think it's like that's where you get some of the best nuggets of information i've ever got and it sort of i think it also gets rid of all that hubris or that um you know ivory tower syndrome that i think a lot of people have on on both sides agency and client if you have a lot of data, uh, data, and you are, you know, understanding the media use that you are understanding what kind of social content these people are, you know, are consuming or or, or 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 some other stuff that you can find through that uh, to data, you can't understand their motivation. And our job is to understand what are their desires and motivations, or basically their point of view about the life. And you can't understand by looking at this da this data, like you know, what motivates them to buy one brand uh, instead of the other. That's my biggest yeah. uh, argument about big data. Yeah, you can't understand the why. You'll see what's happened, but you won't know why they did it unless unless you use those methods. Look, and, and just speaking about that, we're kind of talking about, you mentioned a framework before, the Saatchi brutal simplicity approach, or is that a framework? I'm not sure, but I know that when we are trained as strategy people, uh, it depends where you're from management consulting strategy or advertising strategy, it doesn't really matter. Like there are certain mental models or frameworks that you use and you learn all these things generally in your training. And then the person says, I'll oh, just throw them all out. Um, and now sort of like go and, you know, they're all wrong to a certain extent, but they just help you approach certain situations. And I find I end up using a bit of that one, a bit of that one, sort of mix it together depending on the situation. But if I didn't know them in the first place, I wouldn't know to make that first step or that approach to solving the problem or, you know, capitalizing the opportunities. So um, I know you must get this, <laughs> asked this a lot. I know you've got a course on this, but um how important are frameworks in, in strategy and should we be learning them all or, and which ones? It's a very nice question because yesterday I, I had a session <laughs> one hour long where I explained the basics about these frameworks. I started with a age-old planning cycle by Stephen King uh, by explaining the all five steps as I explained a little bit earlier in this conversation that he included in his planning cycle. And then I went into the uh, TBWA disruption model, which uh, when I put these two things to like next to each other, they are very, very similar. 
like basically the only the only difference between them is the convention in one model you need to find the conventions what are in the category in the disruption model on the other side it's just the situation analyzes like where we are and why we are there the rest is the same that you need to visionary and that you need to come up with a strategy and in the disruption model you don't focus on measurement that is in the planning cycle and then there are this whole bunch of varieties of uh, c's 2C, 3C, 4C, 5C, 6C models. And I think this, if we are talking about the basic and the most uh, well-known, the 4C model, I think that's the best model or best blueprint that you need to have in your mind when you think about what kind of information I need to gather usually about my project. But then there's always, as you said, the situations where you can't use the 4C model uh, because you have like a very specific task. And then as I yesterday, I told to my, uh, to my uh, attendees, to my lecture, I said, you can play around, you can use a 3C model, or you can even narrow down to the 2C model, which is like the, the basics of the business. Like you need to have a product and you need to have an audience and then how you will bring them together. And then comes the, the third C, which is usually a context, which can mean the category, which can mean the culture or, um, yeah, I think, uh, or the competition, uh, which is category and competition sometimes are mixed. And um, and then uh, I, I said, like, um, sometimes when you gather even the information based on the 4C model, you can't build a nice story and you need to still have like a new model or need to have some kind of storytelling narratives or some kind of ways how to tell the story again in your mind to kind of bring those findings into the story. So, I mean... It's very important to know the frameworks, but just to understand in which situation you should really need to pull that framework out. And as I said also in my session yesterday, that, for example, disruption model, you can't use or apply for all your projects because it's for the challenger brands. It's for the brands who really want to do something different and, 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 and shake the status quo. It's not about average FMCG brand who just wants to, you know, make a profit. And they just want to, you know... You know, just stay ahead a little bit ahead of the water, above the water. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I literally, um, we've talked about this a lot with some different people like entrepreneurs and, and mm -hmm. myself were just writing about this yesterday around mm -hmm. um, using the wrong playbook at the wrong stage of that company's life cycle. So small brands trying to use a big brand playbook, big brands trying to be all nimble and do a startup sort of agile thing. And like, it's really dangerous when you do that. Like, uh, and, and um, there's this really famous talk by uh, Aswath Demaradan. Um, he's this famous business valuation expert at NYU Stern. And there's this, um, if you're on the Pivot podcast with Scott Galloway and, and Kara Swisher, there's an episode on there if you want to look at it. It's really funny, but he, it, was a, it was a recording of a speech around acting your age as a business. So, or as a brand, if you want to call it that, and like, stop not trying to act your age. Like you're in a, a declining category like you know take bud light for example the category is declining no matter what you do you know you're you're pushing against or you're swimming uphill so just to act your age and stop trying to be you know crazy because there's a bigger force pushing you down so like play within that that reality and that's that's why i'm a big fan of like adapting frameworks to different situations um but i'll just hold you to that like you mentioned this this c's model just for people who don't know what this is what are the c's and um do you have like a top three or five frameworks you could just say off the top of your head and people could research them later the 4c model is basically based on uh, 4c's like um at the core as i said it's like it's just my my understanding by analyzing these models because i have put together this big framework deck and i i have really tried to go into go down to those rabbit holes and find the real authors of those models and and try to really understand like do they hold any some kind of actual truth or some kind of uh, is there some kind of theory or some kind of um, even reasoning behind them because a lot of models in nowadays they are just mixed up from different models but they don't have like a they, they, they don't hold any some kind of they are very flawed I would say and um, a 4C model is basically based on the one side you have a company on the other side you have a consumer which are you know you need to sell the products 
which will stand under the company to the consumers who probably doesn't think about your brand, but they have their needs or they have their motivations where you can come in and kind of, you know, be a hero in, 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 in their situation. And then the other C is the category, which you usually need to take a look, which is basically what's going on in the competition, what your uh, competitors are doing in the field and uh, what the newcomers are doing, like, you know, how they are coming in and how they are maybe disrupting the category or trying to disrupt the category. You need to kind of be at the top of the game and understand like what's going on on both sides. And then it's a culture and culture is like a like a very big broad topic where you need to understand like what what is relevant for this brand like uh, in the cultural context because some brands as for example as nike they are very focused for a very long time for i don't know 30 or more 30 years or more on a cultural ideology and cultural kind of to kind of use the cultural codes and kind of really own the situations or own the moments in the culture. And then there are other brands who are using culture, maybe just in a very kind of narrow context or they don't use the culture at all. For example, if we are again talking about some, I don't know, like a, for a tooth, if we are talking about the toothpaste, probably the toothpaste won't, toothpaste brands won't use a culture at all in their communication because for them it's not the relevant aspect to even talk about. But on the other hand, look at the Dove, how Dove used the cultural moment to kind of talk about real beauty. And it is a FMCG brand. So um, it depends. And I think that, that the people need to, you know, carefully dis- kind of go through as a detective through all these four C's, try to understand like, you know, what are the most important kind of bits of information that they can pull out about each of these quadrants. And then in the middle, come up with uh, one big thought or one strategic proposition for the creative team. And um, uh, if we go back to your question, when you ask like, uh, what are my kind of uh, go-to kind of frameworks? It depends because if we are talking about the brand strategy, there are certain amount of frameworks that needs to be used to kind of come up with the brand positioning. Like there's a framework for target audience segmentation. There's a framework for uh, target personas definition. There's a framework from, for brand pyramid. If we are going uh, into the topic about the uh, advertising strategy or creative strategy, then there will be other frameworks as a 4C model or planning cycle that you can still use to kind of tell your story uh, or you can use a disruption model by TBWA or uh, yesterday in my presentation, in my lecture, I also present. I also presented an ABCD model, which is basically something that uh, one strategist from Sweden, uh, whose name is Nicholas Nordstrom, uh, he created based on the mixture of uh, different agency philosophies. He took at the core the Wyden and Kennedy kind of model, which was ABC model, where they are like kind of they are uh, bringing together the culture and the consumer, and then he. And, and then he added uh, some other levels from TBWA model and also from the Sachi and Sachi. And he created his own, he doesn't want to call it a model, but more like a method how to approach the strategy. So those are my kind of great. models that I'm usually talking about. No, that's great. I mean, I think that's the that's what you do as a good creative person or strategist is like you take little bits and you sort of remix them really and modify them and update them over time. So I think nothing should be really static. But I really like the four, the simplicity of some of those four C ones um, because it's sort of like I've seen Fernando Machado who was you know under that CMO at Dove uh, that campaign you're talking about Real mm-hmm. Beauty who then went to Burger King and did all those moldy whopper things and you could see the intentional way he was trying to insert Burger King into popular culture through some of the things he did with gamers, you know, so he knew the buying context, you know, gamers staying let up night, um, don't have dinner, will, you know, get takeaway or Uber or DoorDash. How do we insert that into, you know, gaming culture? And, you know, he was doing this like trolling of um, Twitch streamers. So it was like Burger King would um, deposit the amount of a particular meal deals it was like three dollars 87 or something like that arbitrary um into into the twitch streamers like account as like a tipping thing and they get you know there was a message like hey you know you could get a burger king you know meal for three dollars 87 or whatever it was right so you could just see this intentional effort around not just going hey we sell burgers you know this is the context but like that cultural 
um, very deliberate cultural insertion method. So, you know, I really like that concept, uh, that framework, sorry, because of that. So uh, I love it. And, and I'm the same, like I, I use different concepts. I create my own and uh, I think, you know, you get a better, better outcome from that. But on that note, is there any frameworks or approaches uh, that people use, which you know are pretty bad and maybe you wouldn't recommend them? I mean, like if you are a ju junior or middle level strategist, like basically you don't have that much experience under your belt, I would not kind of suggest to use models that don't have some kind of like at least theoretical background that those frameworks that people are sharing on LinkedIn and they are like a thousand likes and everybody kind of, you know, gets very hyped about them. But when you kind of go into the details, like uh, as, as a little bit more experienced strategist, or if you are like, uh, if you have read, uh, if you have digged into a theory about uh, brand frameworks, brand brand strategy frameworks, or or, or brand planning frameworks, then you will understand that they are totally flawed. And uh, I can't mention the names at the moment, but there were a lot of frameworks that I had I have collected through the time, and I what I added them to my framework deck, and then I met the Uri Barushin. Uh, who is like a professor in uh, two very well-known universities in London, and he went through my deck in a in a in a, our um, chat, and he said like, "Bye, but these frameworks they don't hold any truth." And then we went through uh, through through my framework deck, and we tried to uh, we cut out all of those flawed frameworks, and uh, we added a reference to real authors as close as we could get to the frameworks, which are originally somewhere mentioned in the books uh, by professors or someone who has created at least like a presentation to explain like their philosophy or thinking about uh, a thinking process behind the framework. But a lot of these frameworks, they are just like um, blog entries, like, hey, I was just like, you know, sitting here during the weekend and I came up with the framework. And, you know, everybody just likes it because framework feels, framework looks something that is very, uh, something rigor and that is something very important. And if you will put it in your slide, that you will be a smarter person in front of your team, in front of your client. But if you have like a very smart CMO or smart client, they can rip you apart in the presentation when you will share that stuff with them. It reminds me of like most business models, really. Like, you know, there's some alliteration. So it's like, you know, the four P's or the six C's or the seven I's I've even seen in in some of the strategy thing. It's like, um, you know, some professor at a university has tried to coin a new sort of model. And I, and I see it just in, um, uh, you know, uh, for-profit uh, companies as well, trying to, you know, Bain created NPS, for example, um, and spread that throughout the world. And, you know, it doesn't really hold up very well at all, but people still mm -hmm. use it. So, you know, I, I see the commercial benefit in, in coining something like this. And I think that's maybe where we get all this, like, too many models and uh, things that we can use. So it, it, I'm really interested in, like, which ones, like, are, are bad. So it's good that you've done that filtering process for for your community members so i really like that so yeah look if you're following uh biber like go to a community and she's already done the pre-filtering for you so you don't have to worry about those maybe less desirable frameworks but you did mention um junior strategist versus maybe someone more experienced and their ability to to maybe make that discerning uh choice between good and, and maybe less good models um are there any hallmarks of a strategist that is maybe quite green or early in their career and less experienced versus uh, some hallmarks for a very senior, very experienced strategist and the way they would, you know, answer questions or approach their work. Can you give some clients there so that we know if we're hiring a strategist, which one we've got? I mean, uh, it's an excellent question. And uh, I know from my research, uh, when I talk with all those uh, more than 50 strategists and planners across the globe, that even between all of them who were very experienced and on the high positions and with a lot of years of experience under their belts, um, there is this kind of weird thing about us as a strategist. Some of us, at least those guys in those interviews, um, they had like a 
their own philosophy about how strategy should need to be done. And when I when I listened to them, when they answered my questions about the strategy, I felt that they have thought about it. They have really passionately worked in their profession and they have kind of they have created their own kind of vision and I would love to call it as a, their own personal philosophy about the strategy. And then there's a lot of strategists, also experienced ones, who will kind of tell the same phrases that everybody else is talking uh, or, or saying on the LinkedIn or you can read in these strategy books that lately are coming out and they are all more or less talking about the same things. And there's no this kind of unique aspect, at least I'm reading them because I'm a, I'm a nerd, as you can see. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a strategy nerd who likes to, likes yeah, to read same, all of those. Same here. Same here. It's okay. It's okay. Yeah. And, and, and my, my passion, my goal is basically why I'm buying these books and why I'm reading them is to find these kind of unique viewpoints or unique angles, how people are looking at the strategy to, to, you know, to, 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 to make my view, viewpoint a little bit broader and richer. And, um, and yeah, and I can see that um, the more I read, the, the more I understand that uh, I am kind of, you know, the people are just repeating themselves and they are selling the books and the book has a nice cover, but the inside of the book doesn't hold that much of uniqueness, I would say. And uh, going back to, the, to your question between the junior strategist and a very, very senior one, you will hear, as you said, like how they are answering the questions. Uh, for the client, maybe it won't be that easy to understand because they are not into the strategy bubble. They are not kind of consuming the strategy kind of uh, news every day that I am kind of consuming or a lot of other strategies. But um, I mean, for other strategists, when the strategist, especially a CSO, is in the hiring position to hire a new new person for their team, based on the conversation with the strategist, you can easily understand like, are they experienced enough or do they have enough passion to kind of really, you know, to, to come up with the interesting angles and new ideas, uh, interesting, I would say more like interesting strategic directions uh, for, for the creative yeah. team. If you talk with the junior strategist, then probably they will, my apologies, repeat some of these um, uh, well-known strategy influencers, I would like to call them. And usually when I start to ask the question, like, why do you kind of, you know, repeat something that someone else said and trying to kind of um, give me an impression that this is something that you came up because I know that uh, these are the words from another person and this person has his own philosophy, why he's saying the things in that way as, as he's or she's saying. And then these guys can't argument and they feel that they are kind of pushed in the corner by me and then they start to attack. And I have faced these situations mm -hmm from time to time. And that's why I wrote a post also on my LinkedIn. And I said that it's very important for a junior strategist, especially as soon as they start to uh, start to fill the shoes of the strategist to, to understand how to form an opinion. And my advice to form an opinion is to do a triangulation. It's to look look to the same, look at the same topic from three different point of views or from three different kind of people Look, look at the three different kind of people post or ask the same question to three different strategies. And then you can do the triangulation because each of them will have a different experience and they will explain the same uh, topic from, from their experience and from different angle. And then you can do your analysis at the end. Like, okay, I believe the person X, but I kind of don't believe what person Y said. No, no, I use the same thing personally. So um, this just happened uh, a couple of weeks ago. Um, I, I'm a big fan of Richard Feynman's uh, work around the, the Feynman learning technique. So, you know, I, I think the good test of if you understand what you're talking about is your ability to explain it to someone very young. So like a five-year-old or a 10-year-old in very simple terms, but also be able to explain it in very complex terms to someone who's like, very much on your same level, if not higher. And if you can't do both of those things, you don't really understand what you're talking about. Uh, so, so I get it. Some people are enamored with like a cult like sort of figure and will sort of do the copycat thing and you can get away with that and it could be quite good for your career, but you don't really understand it. Um, if, if someone probes you, like maybe you did, um, they don't understand where this thing has come from because they don't understand the base layer. So this happened to me um, a couple of weeks ago when I, I sort of did this tweet on Twitter. It was pretty inflammatory, but anyway, it was intentional. Um, just saying like brand campaigns are a scam. And, um, 
you know, that, you know, you shouldn't buy it and that kind of thing. And then it was just very interesting, the dichotomy between the two camps. So there's a lot of people who said, yeah, that's so true. And other people were like, you're an idiot, <laughs> mostly mm -hmm. from advertising agencies um, going, what are you talking about? You know, and then they were, they, they sort of offered their rationale behind it. So I sort of said, okay, well, okay, that's an interesting opinion, but Lord, why do you say that? And there's a lot of people who, who could answer and maybe go a bit deeper. And there's a lot of people who didn't, they just would, they would handball to, oh, because of this study by this person, haven't you seen the work of this person? And I'm like, yeah, I have actually, I've read it, um, you know, but have you read this other thing? And they're like, oh no. So I think it's just this, um, it's a really good test of, of comprehension, I think. But anyway, I'm getting on tangent. Um, I, I, I suppose maybe this is a, one of the frustrations you see with this conversation in discipline, but there must be other sort of challenges that come up all the time or um, things that you have to deal with that you wish you didn't have to deal with uh, in the role of a strategist. Um, what are they and, and perhaps uh, how can we rid them um, from the client side or agency side or, or both? It's a very good question. And I think uh, one thing, but that's a very personal one. And I, as I said a little bit earlier, I do believe that a lot of strategists will disagree with me, but this is just my personal opinion. Uh, I, I don't agree uh, with this uh, shift too much into the creativity or creative side that we need to think about uh, basically the first ideas for creatives and then they can come and kind of pick like I like this, I don't like this and then I will come up with the third one. I don't like that approach. I think that strategists should need to do their own job properly and then let the creatives to fly on their own on their own time and do their own thing because they are also professionals who are hired to do their job. And the other thing is, of course, like the big, uh, big topic uh, that is now very much uh, discussed around the advertising and strategy bubble is the effectiveness of the campaigns. And I'm not talking about the short term effectiveness. I'm talking about the long term effectiveness. And um, and I think at the core, why we are uh, like like there's like a lot of problems why we are like missing this aspect but in a, but in a lot of cases it's just that on the agency side and and that's again from my experience is that there's like no understanding uh on the strategist side how the business really works in my case my both parents are entrepreneurs so since i was a kid i have been kind of between my two parents and I have heard all those conversations, all those struggles that they are ups and downs. And it's OK that at some point the business just doesn't flow and uh, all their kind of uh, anxieties about their clients and customers. And um, I kind of understand their mindset. I, I, I do understand their mindset. I do understand that what they care about if they go to the advertising agency, at least as my parents has done it, is that um, if they give like a certain amount of money, they want to see uh, something in return, that there will be like two times more money in return. And this is the aspect about the effectiveness that strategies does, just don't get it, that their job is to somehow get that uh, uh, kind of money back for the client and even to, to get like a bigger sales or bigger revenues. What they care about and nowadays a lot is about how we will come up with a creative idea, how we will win some awards and how we will, you know, look really uh, interesting and smart on the LinkedIn. But that's not the, the, the core interest why clients are going to the agencies for the creative solutions to their problems. Well, I, I think that's I think it's pretty common. Uh, I, I think it's, it's a detachment of the marketing role. And, and you know, I use that word very broadly in terms of, you know, advertising promotions, you know, everything. Mm -hmm. But that, that, that role of the business um the detachment from commercial outcomes and it's more of a political sort of outcome or i call it political visibility or political optics so it's all about things that sound good and look good as opposed to things that actually are commercially beneficial and you know obviously when you're hiring a vendor that's not part of your company there's going to be differing interests there like you know they're trying to make as much money as they can and you know make the most profit off you and and vice versa you're trying to get the most out of them for the least amount of money um but i think you know the more you're both aligned in in some mutual outcome um the the more that maybe the vendor can learn from that and be directed into things that actually produce value you know i'm talking monetary value here as opposed to you know political value or, or the optics side of things so i think it's quite synonymous with with all roles, um, not just not just strategists, but perhaps most obvious in the strategist role. 
It's super nice that you mentioned the word alignment, because I believe that both sides need to kind of work together for the same goal. Client has a problem and agency is kind of there to serve the client. I, like not to serve, but more to support and help to the client. And then uh, both sides together are in the alignment on what kind of objectives should need to be achieved and what are the best ways to how to achieve those objectives. The other problem on the client side is that there are this kind of loop with the CMOs that they are changing. They have this kind of two year life cycle and then they are, you know, going to another company where they will probably get a bigger uh, salary check. And this is a problem with the uh, um, knowledge storehouse that one CMO maybe has a very good ideas or very good vision about the brand. But when the, that person leaves the, the company, the new person comes in and thinks that everything needs to be transformed and changed. And then the whole team on the client side starts to struggle. And there's also some kind of, you know, people are coming, people are leaving, and people just don't keep that information in some kind of one place, like what we have done, I don't know, in the past five years that we can go to the agency and tell like, basically, hey, we did all of these campaigns, there was success, there was some kind of, you know, decrease in the success. So, you know, uh, they aren't also transparent from their side, and they don't share what they have done so far, or what they have done in the history, uh, in, in their nearest history. And, um, uh, and that makes the situation complicated because from the outside, um, agency people can't understand if the ad was successful or not. Like just basically looking at the YouTube, how can you understand the success of the ad? But the the, the feedback one. loop is, is sort of cut. I, I know what you mean. It's like they, they can't measure the efficacy of their own work because they don't know the actual results from it. So, and then when it changes, the next person comes in, you know, it's, there's no consistency. So you can't look at it over a longer time period as well. So it stuffs up all your sort of longer term brand effects as well. I've noticed anyway. Um, what's something about strategy that most people believe in, but which you know to be wrong? I think we already discussed this topic at a little bit earlier in this conversation. I do believe that whole hype around the word insight, because if you, if anyone wants to read the history about the account planning, I highly suggest really to uh, read the 98% uh, pure potato by John Griffiths and uh, Tracy uh, follow. Uh, two authors, and sorry, I'm uh, promoting other people's book, but other other people's work. Um, but that that book is fascinating because it's based on the research. And in that book, they say that uh, insight wasn't a word. Those guys who created an account uh, uh, planning as a discipline, they didn't have that word, they didn't use that word, and that word kind of came into our discipl discipline only in 90s. And now we are all focused, like, like I would say majority of us are focused on the insight. We need to find the insight. So insight is important. We need to have like a uh, defined uh, sentence structures, how to write down the insight and where should we need to look for an insight and all that stuff. And uh, I think that's like a quite big uh, misconception about our job. You did mention this book already, but perhaps there's another book you're reading right now or have read very recently that you would recommend other people read because it's changed your the way you think for the better. Yeah, the book is called What Sticks. It's by Rex Briggs. Uh, Rex Briggs is the one guy, the other guy I can't remember. It's a book from 2005. It's also based on the research. And they were researching 50 biggest, uh, not the biggest, but the quite big international companies that are basically based in United States. And they try to understand through their research what are some kind of problems between company and agency work and how to basically improve their collaboration. And they talk, uh, they kind of figure out like five steps uh, how to improve the collaboration and, 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 and they call it COPS and it's, it's abbreviation from communication, optimization, process or program, something like that. And, and one of the, one of the thing is alignment that, that there needs to be alignment between the client and the agency. And the other thing is that, uh, agency really needs to understand like, uh, uh, the objectives or goals, what the client wants to achieve, and there needs to be in this alignment. And then there was the thing that was very important also to understand um, about this uh, knowledge storehouse, like, you know, that the, the company needs to have the, some kind of sort of knowledge storehouse where they are kind of collecting uh, their experience, what has what where, where they 
kind of uh, succeeded and where were some kind of missed opportunities and that there needs to also be this scenario planning uh, kind of stage or phase where you are kind of planning on the client side like before the campaign is kind of uh, launched that okay what we will do if the campaign will succeed and the other scenario like what we will do if the campaign will fail and then there needs to be like steps planned in between that uh what actions they will take that is also not usually kind of done on the client side and there are other things that they are talking uh in their book based on that research findings about what is missing and what needs to be improved i found this book fascinating and i i suggest always to to to, to my um i don't know mentees and uh, trainees to read the, the this book so yeah that's my um uh, my suggestion what about a sneaky website that is your sort of golden website that you don't want to tell other people about, but you're going to because you're on this podcast. I, I think this is like a little bit, that I need to promote myself because I created this notion link, which is called strategy link bank. And that's basically the place where I see something interesting popping up somewhere. I just plug it in that the notion file Sounds and good. it's available. It's available for everyone, but there are so many interesting kind of websites and articles and blogs that I'm, I'm sometimes I'm going back and I'm rereading them and um, and uh, yeah that's my way how I'm learning also about the strategy and my way how to also at the same time share my learning process with the brother brother audience. I was just talking to uh, Dan Hockenheimer, um, uh, Hocken Hockenmeyer, sorry. Yeah, mm -hmm. he he runs this. Um, he he's with Reforge, the growth SaaS organization. Anyway, he has this podcast called The Acquired Podcast. Highly recommend you listen to them about the uh, Nintendo episode and the LVMH one. But basically, he goes through like they're, they're like two or three hours long each, but it goes through the whole history of how the company that is successful today came to be. And the stories are fascinating. Like Nintendo and LVMH have just iterated and changed so much since the early days, it's not funny, but um, I was just talking to him and he has this really good Substack link similar to you with um, what he calls uh, long form uh, long form stories or something. But anyway, it's just a, a bunch of other people writing about it all in one sort of concentrated resource that like, categorized. And I was like, oh, this is like a gold mine. So I, I found it the other day and I, it reminded me of the one that you have, which I'm like, okay, well, I don't need to go anywhere else because somebody's already collated everything for me. So, okay, we'll, we'll put the link in the comments so everyone uh, knows exactly where to go to. But I'm sure if they go to your LinkedIn page, I know you're always putting the link in there so they can pretty, find it pretty easily. Um, next thing though, what about a piece of tech? Uh, that helps you do your job better. Um, it can be software and it can be hardware. It's your choice. What do you recommend? When I started to work as a strategist, someone uh, told like a very nasty joke my, about my boss during that time, my head of the planning. And, and the person said like, your boss is not living in, re in reality. He lives in a PowerPoint <laughs> because in, in that time, PowerPoint was still kind of like a go-to uh, tool uh, for the strategist. And uh, by knowing that we are living in a keynote or in a PowerPoint or in a Google slides or in a Canvas slides, then probably those are the tools that you need to really uh, know and uh, understand how to be, again, at the top of the game, how to make it really interesting. And, you know, your presentation needs to still be a digital, pro digital pro product that you are selling to your client. And that's something that uh, sometimes, sometimes we are kind of, you know, lacking that. We are too focused, we as a strategist, we are too focused on uh, content aspect, like, you know, what will be the strategy? Is my framework looking good? Or my story is like really, you know, flowing and really nicely kind of uh, put together. And we forget about the presentation part. We believe that the creatives will come in and, you know, they will do the, the magic. And sometimes they don't have a time. And that's why I think it's very important just to know some tricks, how to make your PowerPoint to your presentation to stand, stand out. Is there a quote or a meme that makes you laugh every time because it's so true or just like is the one that you always use in every presentation because, you know, it's just so, so poignant or true? Like over to you. No, there's no like uh, one quote or one meme that I'm using uh, most of the time, but I can share 
uh, a one meme uh, that I found, uh, I think two weeks ago on the Twitter, which was about the brands that uh, people are st starting to use like a, like a ananas, I think it's an ananas on your head and then brands start to copying them and then people- Oh, the all, pineapple uh, one, yes. Yeah, yes, pineapple yes, one. Yes, ananas yeah. is the, um, yeah, ananas is the French word for it. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> Latin yeah. word for it. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. it's like, um, it was it was around um, when, when corporate brands start using the meme. So it's really cool. Yeah. But, you know, people have yeah. this pineapple on the head, like, uh, and it's all friends. And then as soon as a, a brand comes in, everybody goes, oh, why are they doing that? And the next scene is like, you know, all the brands have the pineapple on the head and there's no other people around. <laughs> it's like, so they've lost the audience and they've lost the cultural relevance. I've seen that one. It's, it's, it's hilarious. And it's, it's so true. It's like, you know, the, the, the meme or the thing goes around and then six months later, some lame company starts to use it and you're like, oh my God, it's like, it's so old. <laughs> Uh, what about um, something you want to promote? So over to you now. It's your turn to plug. I know you've already mentioned your Notion site, but um, uh, if someone is listening to this and they are interested in maybe hiring you or approaching you for something, what's the best way to contact you? Do you have a website? I, I have my portfolio or website in the process. I'm putting it together still. Uh, and um, the best way how to get in touch with me is through LinkedIn or uh, some folks also know uh, my email, but uh, usually I think people are reaching out me, uh, reaching out to me through the LinkedIn. Well, um, I just want to thank you very much for your time uh, today. I think it's been a really interesting conversation delving into the world of, of uh, strategists, uh, a creative and a brand strategist and at that. So yeah, thanks again for coming on the show. I really appreciate it and um, all the best in the future. Thank you. It was my pleasure. And uh, it was uh, super exciting to have a conversation with you. Thank you very much for your time.